interrupts everything. They don't. Once upon a time, they used to know where everybody was going to be, and they don't manage that anymore. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, John. So, the mega project paradox. Some vocabulary to begin with. Uh, there's actually a book written on mega projects. Probably a few books, but the guy who's um, really the thought leader in the space, a chap by the name of Ed Merrow, runs a company called the called IPA or Independent Project Analysis out of Washington DC. And he, as the thought leader, <coughs> um, his company is engaged in virtually every mega project around the world. He's that well known in that space. Um, other companies like the Construction Industry Institute out of Boston, Texas, um, the uh, University of Texas, their engineering faculty, uh, they implement methods similar to, um, to Ed's company. Um, people like uh, Bent Flyberg out of the UK and uh, Ray Levitt out of Stanford also do interesting work in this space. Um, but <clears throat> so th there is a real science behind this. And uh, if not for the work that these guys have done and the work that I've done with their stuff over the last 20, 30 years, um, I wouldn't be talking about what I'm talking about today. So first of all, what's a mega project? Well, in my, my I define a method called the Noonan method for mega project risk mitigation because it's so different to what anybody else is doing that uh, I have to give a, a tag that people will recognise. There's a there's eight there's twelve parameters that uh, are generic parameters that are needed, I believe, to define a mega project of any type in any industry. If we can get a single vocabulary, <clears throat> and these 12 words are really the, the vocabulary that's needed to be used, we're going to head in the right direction. Um, but I'll use two of those to give an indication of what a mega project is. As of the turn of the century, a mega project would have a budget of at least a billion dollars. I'd argue today you need to have a decabillion dollar budget to have a mega project. So people would say, well, there aren't too many projects like that in Adelaide. In fact, there's absolutely none. So usually I'm doing my work somewhere like Western Australia or Queensland or somewhere overseas. Another um, benchmark or indication that you're dealing with a mega project is that the life cycle is at least measured in decades, if not more than a century. So life cycle and, um, uh, and cost are two indicators that you're dealing with a mega project. I mean, life cycle, you've got lots of different life cycle diagrams for different industries but um, I mean there's just a couple of different views of life cycle if you're in the oil and gas industry the life cycle is of one type if you're in the construction industry it's another type just hand those pass them down um, so it depends on which industry what the actual life cycle looks like but uh, they have the common time frame decades or more than a century so um, what is a paradox? Well, I'm going to read a de definition of that. A seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition which, when investigated, may prove to be well-found or true. When I combine those two terms, mega project and paradox, <coughs> people say, what are you talking about? Well, think of it this way. If you're taking the biggest, most well-funded companies in the world, who typically hire notionally the very, very best people in the world, if they decide to build the biggest, most complex infrastructure that's ever been built, usually nothing like it has ever been built in history, so they're starting on something that's never been built of that scale before, they're putting in very sophisticated, enormous contracts that bind the owner to a non-owner EPC or EPCM, and those companies bring with them their intellectual property, which includes a supply chain of subcontractors, vendors, suppliers, and consultants. Yet the question gets begged, why then do 100% of these projects fail to achieve what the owner predicted in terms of the cost to execute and the time frame in which it would be executed? 100%. What other industry would we accept failure at that level, 100% failure. 
for a lot of the IT people that sit around this table, NBN's a very good example. <coughs> so that, that's effective. Does that explain what the mega project paradox is? You know, you've got the biggest and best of everything, the best money can buy, yet everything just fails. So for those of you that have worked on smaller projects, you're going to say, well, that's actually got some similar characteristics to projects that I've worked on. You know, you'll see failure occur at the $10,000 level, at the $100,000 level, at the million dollar level, etc., etc. Um, similar characteristics. So I, I coined the term mega project paradox because the clients that I work with have those budgets, have those schedules, have those complex problems, and um, they want to know people have got that sort of engagement with previous experience. So basically, Thought Leadership by Ed Merrow, <coughs> which is followed not only by IPA, CII, uh, people out of the UK, the US, all of the management consultants, McKinsey, um, the big four, they all do it the same. It's an intervention. And that intervention includes interviews, due diligence, surveys, usually anonymous surveys of at least 10% of the organisation. And then they have facilitated meetings of all the key people, the executive leadership team, to look at the evidence collected through the interviews and the surveys and try and identify how they can change the way they're working to actually succeed instead of fail. Well, <clears throat> I have some statistical information here from the Construction Industry Institute 2012 Performance Assessment Report. <clears throat> This is really the best statistical evidence um, that exists about the precision around failure. And I'll hand that on. There's two, there's two sheets. CII examined 975 mega projects from around the world from its owner community. And it plotted those 975 projects on a two axis chart. One is project cost growth, positive and negative. The other one is project schedule growth, positive and negative. And they spoke to the owners and they asked them to define the success box around the origin. It couldn't be right on the origin, you know, not this minute, not this dollar. They wanted to say, okay, within a, a reasonable tolerance, what would you consider as the owner community successful execution of the project? And <clears throat> I'll pass this around. One of the graphs shows that 5% of all the projects fell inside the success box. And if you look at this graph and come to me, as some others have said, John, this graph's not right. There's not, a, there's not 975 dots here. I'll tell you now, read the sentence below. 70% don't fall within the plus or minus 10% tolerance of the origin. This diagram shows the NPV consequences of falling inside the success box or falling outside the success box. So pass that around. So that's the statistical evidence. You've got other articles from McKinsey that will tell you that not 95% fail, but 98% fail. Whether it's 95% or 98%, my belief is that the, the 5 or the 2% that succeed are statistical fluke. It is not planning. It is not success. It is sheer, unmitigated fluke at that level, which should certainly got me asking, well, what the hell? How, how could this be? So there's statistical evidence that underpin the mega project paradox, but I have some interesting experience. There's uh, one or two of you that have worked with me at the University of Adelaide many years ago. In fact, Valdis was a student when I was teaching electrical engineering, and Ian I worked with when I was with Sun. Um, and uh, what I did as my master's degree in electrical engineering at Adelaide University was um, I developed a suite of design, modelling, simulation, analysis and verification tools for integrated circuit design. I subsequently designed some integrated circuits, had them fabricated, and then I tested the integrated circuits to prove that the simulation results matched the test results. In other words, I used the tools to verify the design before I fabricated it, and then I used the design once it was working to, to verify that the simulation tools, that the design tools worked. Why did I do that? Well, you've heard of Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was a founder of uh, Intel, came from Fairchild. Originally, when he, when he was with Fairchild, he met a chap by the name, name of Carver Mead at Caltech. He was selling transistors to him as, a, as an academic. 
and they became lifelong buddies. It was um, Carver Mead who effectively coined the term Moore's Law. And Moore's Law raced ahead from the early 60s through to the mid 70s when they confronted a problem. Keep in mind in the early 70s to mid 70s, is anybody old enough to remember what computers looked like back then? Punched cards, at best paper tape. Um, the human computer interface was more like a typewriter. <coughs> you dealt with big decks of cards that you didn't want to drop. Right? So the consequence was, um, does, for the first time by the mid 70s, transistor size had shrunk to the point where you could actually get millions of transistors on a chip. <coughs> what we discovered at that time, or what me, me and more confronted at that time, certainly at Intel, was teams of people had never worked together before to try and design successfully and get working transistor chips with millions of transistors on them. So Moore's law was hitting a ceiling at that time because people could not be organised to work together. Carver Mead and Lynn Conway from Caltech and Xerox Park then put together a multi-project chip effort which included the development of design tools, visual front-end design tools, modelling tools, simulation and analysis tools to allow verification of circuits and to let teams of people work together. And I'm proud to say I trained Valdis on that stuff a little bit, uh, went through his uh, electrical engineering degree. So, um, and what we know today, 30 years later, keep in mind that I was doing this work in the early 80s before PCs were released, before Macintoshes were released. Uh, we were playing with great big RGB colour monitors on top of boxes this size by that width, which were nothing more than a frame buffer. We were using keyboards in this funny thing called a mouse, which nobody knew what the hell it was, to control um, to control graphic elements on a screen. Here we are 30 years later, and every engineer knows the philosophy of design, model, simulate, analyze, and verify when it comes to infrastructure. Suites of tools exist in all disciplines of engineering, electrical, mechanical, civil, chemical, process, material, you name it, there's a suite of tools for design, modeling, simulating, analyzing, and verifying infrastructure before it's fabricated. In fact, we've had a speech here only a couple of months ago from the chap from Cyan Research about the digital twin concept, which exists in defense explicitly. The digital twin is effectively a, uh, a defense acronym for a model. And the concept there is that before you do anything new with your real defence thing, whether it be a ship, a plane or a weapon, doesn't matter what it is, you test that new thing on your digital twin before you do it with the real thing. So the Noonan method for mega project risk mitigation is all about translating what we already know for infrastructure and applying it, believe it or not, to people. So, the Noonan method for mega project risk mitigation is design, model, simulate, analyze, and verify before deployment the mega project organization. This requires the development of sophisticated um, models based on Monte Carlo simulation techniques with para parametric input that allows you to vary it. Now, if this sounds a bit far fetched, a bit science fiction, I've been doing this for some years with rudimentary tools that already exist, and that's an example of a model that's, that's used. That model, once developed, you can then simulate over and over and over again, and the sort of results you get, and I'll pass this around as well, looks, you know, th this example of results from the simulation of the model are, um, they, they are reminiscent of the sort of reports you would get out of a sophisticated project management tool like Primavera or Microsoft Project. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what the Noonan method, mega, um, Noonan method for mega project risk mitigation is. Um, it relies on the definition of a, of a vocabulary of 12 parameters. So, the, the rule parameters are structure, culture, um, uh, sorry, strategy, structure, culture, and behaviour. So, they're not, these terminologies are not new. In fact, a lot of these people converse with me on LinkedIn and, and the first 
ones were quite, oh, why are you putting the name Noonan on this? I've been using these parameters for 40 years. And I go, aha, uh -huh, so that means you've been using them as parametric input to sophisticated combinations of algorithms, probably 10 to 20 algorithms of Monte Carlo simultaneous differential equations so that you can model how when you change those parameters, you get output. And the answer I get is absolute silence. So this is, there's only a few people that do this in the world. And uh, the current status of my work is I'm working with a group out of California to begin to implement this for certain clients. So thank you. Have you? <laughs> no. um, thank you, John. Um, um, I'll kick off the in introductions. Um, I'm John Lindsay. 